Hello, and welcome back to Legend of the Glorio Heroes. You're listening to episode 35. As always, we are here and ready to discuss the latest going-ons in the legendary 1988 science fiction OVA. Even when things aren't as exciting as they could be, we still find ways to jit up entertaining hashtag content for all you listeners. Mm-hmm. As always, I'm your host, G, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Eero. Yep, I'm still here as the, uh, you know, premier Legend of Galactic Heroes influencer uh, yes. on the internet. Yes, uh, you know, uh, like and subscribe, Hit, let's smash that like button. Uh, soon we will be selling our... Um, I wish I could make a joke, but honestly, I do not even know enough <laughs> about influencer culture. The, the, think, the closest thing I can think of is, like... That gamer girl bathwater thing that happened a few months that ago did happen, didn't it? I don't. I was don't it know. A gamer how to... girl was a cosplayer or something. Like yeah, that. I don't. I don't know how to turn that into a bit about Legend of the Galact. Which, okay, if the Legend of the Galactic is Emil Heroes... von Sekla just uh, bottle the Kaiser's bathwater, <laughs> bottle bath water. and sell it to uh, oh, enterprising God. folks. God, I was that's. That puts Emil von Sekla and it casts him in an entirely different light. If uh, does uh, does uh, uh, Count Leinsberg, you know, does he? Make, oh, what does he sell bottles of, uh, of the, the Kaiser's, Kaiser's bath, bath water? <laughs> yeah, I like how we were just gonna like slyly bring that up and not like address why we're at. Well, why would we? Why would we bring up Landsberg and the young Kaiser Christ. in this interesting trio of episodes? <laughs> Uh, yes, the trio of 99, the approach run towards the future, and episode 100, Long Live the Empress, Hoff Kaiserin, and episode 101, An Invitation to War. We're yeah, in the three digits. We are here. We are at episode the home 100. the homestretch for real this time. 100. Yeah. It's, uh, we finally made it. Somehow, you know, it's... I can't, I, you know, I honestly, if I'm thinking about it, I don't know if I've ever watched any, this many episodes of, like, any TV show, right? Like, any, I mean, you watch Pokemon, so I guess. I do watch Pokemon. You know. Yu uh, Yu show is about this long. Yeah, but I stopped, finish. but, you know, I stopped watching Yu Yu Hakusho after it uh, got okay. bad, so. Uh, I don't know, Dragon Ball Kai is around, like, 100 episodes Okay, okay, fine, fine. You were talking about, like, the old, the real old school stuff, I guess. Uh, right, at, uh, yes. at some point. Does that really count? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm more thinking, like, have I ever watched 100 episodes of something so, like, plot-heavy? Like, right. like, look, if you miss an episode or two of Dragon Ball Z, you miss a few episodes of Pokemon, <laughs> you can still kind of figure out where things are going. You miss a few episodes of L- Legend of the Galactic Heroes, and you all of a sudden go from, like, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> Reinthal about to start his rebellion to Reinthal's already dead, but John Schrunicht is too. <laughs> you know, like, that's what, uh-huh. could, that's what could happen in the span of just a few episodes uh-huh. of this series. How many episodes is that uh, Romance of Three Kingdoms drama? You know, I do want to get to that someday, you know. Uh, I would love to. It's not really anime, but maybe someday we'll do our uh, Legend of the Three Glorios recap <laughs> podcast uh-huh. of the legendary, I think, 2008. <laughs> Yes, yes, like 2008 Romance of the Three Kingdoms live action drama from a few years back. <laughs> okay, I wanted to keep this a short <laughs> podcast, so we should just All right. keep, we should just uh, Yeah, episode 99 <laughs> kicks off with uh, Mittermeier returning to Fazan with the yes. fleet. And with the baby. A, uh, and, a ba- and the baby, you know. Uh, they've, they've scored a victory against the traitor Royenthal um, and their home. I mean, and, <laughs> not oh, just sort of victory. I mean, the the rebellion is is well and truly dead at this point. It's true. You know, this is uh, ostensibly the empire is finally at peace. Finally, absolutely, finally. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yep. Uh, they basically report back to, to uh, Kaiser Reinhard and all that, and Reinhard calls Mittermeier back into his office uh, to basically reminisce about 
simpler times when Kirkyeyes and Roenthal were both alive. Yes, are we? Are are is is Roenthal going to become the newest member of the If Only X Were Here Club? I mean, how many situations are there when you'd think If Only Roenthal Were Here? Yeah, if I'm being entirely honest, the number of times in my entire life that I might say If Only Roenthal Were Here, I could probably count on one hand, and that would probably be like very desperate moments like i don't know i am cornered in a bar fight maybe if only sure. roythal were here mm-hmm. if only i need to get rid of a body if only roythal were here <laughs> like i need Kirk someone Eisen to Young, smuggle some shit i don't know yeah like i mean th- maybe that's what it is is roythal is your more shady buddy who's who, who won't judge you for like for that kind of shit because like if you need to get rid of a body like you know Kirk uh-huh. Eyes would like like Kirk Eyes would do it but he would give you this look, and then he'd ask to speak with you in private. <laughs> like, Yang Wen Lee would be too physically weak to lift a corpse, I think. Uh-huh. Roenthal would... wouldn't even blink. Right, Roenthal's the guy who wouldn't blink. He'd be like... Next day, his business as usual, he'd never mention it again. Right, right. Like, Roenthal would never say a word ever again. So, you know what? In that regard, <sighs> maybe we all need a Roenthal in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> your shady ass friend will... your shady friend who sometimes goes on rants about women <laughs> god but yes right. yes we're yes. both defeated and yeah so it's kind of an interesting moment here where reinhardt basically reminisces that like it's just the two of us now like i have right. i am running out of people i can confide in you know and mm-hmm. I mean, arguably, Roenthal and Mittermeier were not even part of that true inner circle with with Reinhardt. Right. But. Episode, uh, season four has kind of tried to say, no, they were always part of the inner circle. But uh, I, I don't I think, think they, they really have been. <laughs> no, no, I don't think the show, if that's what the show wanted us to think, I don't think it ever did a great job of communicating that. I think mm. that, like... I mean, I think it's all. I mean, I think it's very obvious, of course, not just to Reinhardt, but also the other admirals that, like, okay, of course, Mittermeier and Roenthal kind of occupy a like a, a higher echelon of admiral than your than your Kevs and your Wallens and your Mecklingers, but yeah, they were never like the kind of people that like Reinhardt would confide in about doing handstands at Anna Rose's house or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is still kind of a bittersweet moment, you know, yeah. Reinhardt is like, it's just the two of us now. And I feel like this is a thing that I think we speculated about in prior seasons, but I think Legend of the Galactic Heroes is finally beginning to recognize that the Empire is in fact suffering its own very real brain drain, mm-hmm. right? When Reinhardt says, please live, Mittermeier, like, you're the only one left who can teach tactics right like can can pass on the teachings of our generation to the next generation of like officers and it's like oh yeah like like of course there are other talented admirals that you know again your volens and your bitten you know it's it's a talent for a meaning of the word uh uh uh, bitten fields but like in terms of like truly like like the person you would want to canonize empire fleet tactics for the next generation it's kind of just Mittermeier now. The Gale Wolf. Yep. Yeah, like because the other the, the other options are dead, and it's kind of a bitch to just like jump. Okay, obviously I don't know how the show ends, but if you jumped ahead in Legend of Black Heroes timeline, like let's say 150 years, and then like yeah. how much of military doctrine of the Empire is based upon the tactics of the Gale Wolf in like speedy movement, etc. Yeah, you know, as opposed to whatever other you know like if if your main surviving military leaders are Bittenfield and Mittermeier <laughs> military mi- you know yeah yeah no I think that's not a is about pushing in right like I don't think that's a I, I don't think that's such an absurd thing you to know speculate and then about like is. <laughs> military historians 100 years later we'll talk about Iron Shield Mueller as a coward who fought defensively I mean you're not like that's the thing I don't think this is so absurd like you know, I think I think the I think the victors or or what is it the you know history is written by the victors is a very like cliche trite statement, but the more accurate statement I think historians agree on is more vi- history is written by the people who are still alive. Yeah, history was written by the survivors, yeah. right? And those, they aren't always necessarily winners. I mean, you only need to look at like America's own historiography of the Civil War which was largely written by surviving Confederate mm. generals, which has kind of 
perhaps colored our country's uh, <laughs> uh, perception <laughs> of a war. It, 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 but that's the thing. Like, it, it is written by those who live. And if the people who are alive at the end of this show are, yes, it's Miramire and Bittenfield writing the history, you know, writing the books on tactics. Yeah, it, 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 I could see them turning to a very aggressive uh, doctrine. I mean, I think they only lightly touch upon it, but I think the thing they often say about the FPA military is that the FPA military is not as like, they are not as explicitly delusionally stupid as like the worst empire admirals, <laughs> but what they are is that are very like bullheaded and stubborn and set in their ways. And I think the implication is that they're still learning or right, still teaching the, the same. In the first episode, uh, like they talk about how that, the like three smaller fleets trying to surround the surround and encircle the one larger was a tactic based on like the FPA's first big battle against Empire where they totally trashed the Empire. Right. And and it's like, like oh, oh let's do that again. Right. And so there's this idea that 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 the teachings of those who live long enough to to to, to write down their teachings can have very very long reaching consequences and uh yeah and yeah so after that uh uh Mittermeier, uh decides to pay uh hilda a visit because uh Mittermeier hasn't told reinhardt about the baby yet and right. is like Mittermeier is understandably a little bit concerned because you know like Look, the Reinhardt child is the... of this man who rebelled against them. Yes, Boy, yes, and let's just to put down. Yes, and let's not forget that Reinhardt is the same man who said that every person above the age of ten should be executed because they no longer count as children. So, uh-huh. you know, I was like basically asking Hilda to convince Reinhardt to let him keep the kid, and Hilda's yeah. like, ah, should be fine. It's just a baby, and like, right. And uh, even under a legal, quote unquote, legal precedent, because it's a bastard child, the father's crime has no bearing on them. Right, which is like, wait, what's the implication there? That, like, <laughs> if he wasn't a bastard, he would have to answer for Roenthal's crimes. Like, that's, I don't know how I feel about that legal system, but, uh, but yes, basically, Hilda, <laughs> no, Hilda says yes. the, the kid is fine on a technicality. But did you talk to your wife about this? All of it, yes. Then Mitter was like. Oh crap! Right, like the one person I the the uh, first person I maybe I maybe should have told about the baby. <laughs> but, yes, uh, but yes, and also uh, says they're gonna bring in uh, Heinrich here, the yes, dude we'll, who uh, wrote down Ronthal's last words and has yes. been taking care of this baby. That we're just a, basically we're basically going to adopt him too or something. You that know, was just, a little unclear on if he's being adopted or if he's just becoming the help. From I think house. it's. I think. I mean, frankly, I think it's the latter. I just think it's very mm-hmm. funny that <laughs> yep. the baby and and Heinrich come in a two part deal. You get this. You get a <laughs> the baby like dribbles on Heinrich's shirt at the start of the scene, and <laughs> like has he has a stain on him for the rest of the scene. Yes, yes, it's very good. Uh, but yeah, so Wintermeyer finally returns home, uh, mm-hmm. and. Uh, gives Eva the news and Eva uh-huh. is uh, basically <laughs> oh, nonplussed about it because you pay, I see you picked up this baby from the cabbage farm called Royenthal. <laughs> yes, very good line. Yes, just I I had kind of went, so Eva eventually reveals that uh, Hilda called her ahead of time to give uh-huh. her the news but I kind of prefer the like the like explanation I came up with in my head which is that Eva has just such a keen understanding of Mittermeier and the man he is mm-hmm. that when he shows up with a baby at the doorstep, she immediately knows, oh, that must be Roenthal's kid. And Mittermeier's so much of a loyal goober that, of course, he would bring it home. So. Uh-huh. And uh, she names the baby Felix. Yes, Felix which, uh, Mittermeier. Yeah, Felix Mittermeier. Uh, or his full name, Felix Mittermeier Roenthal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, only after this whole conversation do we invite Heinrich indoors. Yes, he's been standing outside the outside, whole time. Standing outside carrying the sundries. Yes. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, it's a, I, there's not a whole t- much more to say about the scene in many ways. Like, it is just a, it is the conclusion of the last, like, mm-hmm. the last, ah, what's the word? Like, the last... Gift is maybe not the right word, but the, I'll use it here. The last gift of Roenthal, right? Like, Roenthal's final 
for, in a very roundabout way, Royto's final gift to his closest friend, a baby. It's like Ryan. It's like Ryan. <laughs> Just imagine, like, Renthal's dead, and you gotta take his car into the DV or whatever, and in, in, the, in the drug com- in the glove compartment, you find like a baggie of drugs, and then like five hundred dollars in cash. <laughs> yes, and just a, written, a handwritten note that's like for my best bro, Mittermeier. <laughs> and it's like, why would you fucking indict me <laughs> like that, Renthal? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Hilda goes to visit <laughs> the Kaiser. Yes. And uh, finally spills the beans that uh, she's got a baby in her. Yes, she's like yes. four or five months pregnant and doesn't look it at all. Doesn't even look it like halfway pregnant. Like, look, I know that like how pregnancy shows ranges from 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 woman to woman. It does. But Hilda is I don't know what kind of fucking empire magic medical science they have where they can completely hide the pregnancy five yeah. months in, but. I'm a yes. little. I'm a little curious. Like the show doesn't dwell on this, but I'm a little bit curious as to whether like the Empire frowns upon premarital sex, and they're just giving her a pass because it's the Kaiser, or yeah, if I, or if was, they or if it's like just no big deal. I was very curious about this part, and I'm a little disappointed that with episode 100, they don't really. They don't really explain one way or another, right? Like, they're broadly supportive of the marriage and the pregnancy. And again, like, I don't want to, like, you know, cast aspersions on the Empire, but based on every other cultural touchstone of the Empire they're, we know they're, of... They're a uh, traditionalist, let's say. Yes, yes. They are a, quote, in scare quotes, traditionalist uh, society. And in... In, in quote-unquote traditionalist societies, <laughs> premarital sex is generally looked down upon, except when it's done by powerful men. And, yeah, there's not really an indication, like, whether, like, is this okay because, like, the Empire is fine with that? Or is this just okay because, like, it's Reinhardt, and Reinhardt could knock up whoever he wants, and he's the right. Kaiser. And, and, like, there's a little bit of, like, a slight tinge of, like, that kind of golden bomb hypocrisy of, like... Yeah. Like... Is Reinhardt able to get away with this just because he has power? Like it, like he knocked up Hilda, but like, could he have like if if Reinhardt were a much worse person, like could he have gone around mm-hmm. like having just wild sex with random ladies all the time and like right. nobody would hold it against him? And they don't really indicate one way or another. Like it's it's softened because every everybody could see that <laughs> the Hilda was gonna be with reinhardt at some point i mean yes uh, yes everybody was shipping those two together anyways yes so like reinhardt you know, not- uh <laughs> finally gains a bit of self-awareness in this conversation it yes. basically says you're too good for me <laughs> yes yes reinhardt is like i forget the exact line but reinhardt is like basically like hilda you have saved not never only my never steered me wrong I right you're too like good for me honestly <laughs> Yes, like, basically, Reinhardt finally realizing, oh, actually, I should have listened to you every single time, (laughs) and every time I didn't listen to you, it, like, hurt me and the people around me greatly, (laughs) but, uh, I don't know, despite Reinhardt getting the self-awareness, we will see, Yeah, I I mean, that's the thing that's curious, like, now that, you know, Reinhardt and Hilda are officially a couple, like, how much influence will Hilda actually have on Reinhardt's policy making? Yes. Because as we see in the next episode, in some ways, because of becoming the Kaiserin almost restricts Hilda even more in what she can publicly do to, yeah. to influence policy. We'll get to that scene in a bit. Right. Uh, You're right. So we yes. cut to the uh, Earth Cold conference room. Uh- <laughs> yes. Uh, 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 the, yes, the, the Earth cult, uh, otherwise known as out, those out in the galaxy who hold tenacious hatred, <laughs> because the narrator is just loves his fucking, loves his words. Yes, and uh, that points out that like a lot of their plans have succeeded, basically, like Yang is dead, they forced Roenthal into rebellion, so he's also dead. But... In a roundabout way, all of our plans succeeding have not actually helped us that much. <laughs> the person they have helped the most is Reinhard. And, yeah. you know, well, it turns they're, out if your plan is about getting someone into power so then you can take him down. If you can't take him down, you've really fucked up 
Yes, and there is definitely a, a, a vibe of, like, even the Earth cult beginning to realize, shit, like, <laughs> we put a lot of oh, our yay. chips on, on toppling Reinhardt, but as a result, like, we have sacrificed all the other chips that could have helped us do it. And Devulia is, like, nonplussed at this. Uh -huh. He just starts laughing according maniacally. And yes, you know, it's all it, according it, all according to Kate Kaku. In a fucking organization like the Earth Cult, I think <laughs> busting out your evilest laugh possible is probably not a terrible way to silence the crowd. Oh no, it's completely valid. Oh, okay. It's just ridiculous. If he, can, if he can have an evil laugh like that, he must have, he must be knowing what's going. He must know what's going on. Yes. He must have a plan if he can laugh like that. Indeed, it's it's. It's very, it's very good. It's it, the Earth Cult continues to be the part of this story that is like simultaneously incongruous with the rest of it. But like, I would never give it up for anything in the world. So <laughs> their but, aesthetics uh, are maybe incongruous, but yes, yes, that is fair. But uh, yeah, so this, but you know, they're we can't deal with the Earth Cult right now because there's just so many things to worry about, including a strange rumor yeah. that is spreading on Hynason. Strange rumors. Valen is investigating the strange rumors. Uh, they've heard that the Kaiser is dead! And Valen jumps out of his seat asking, uh, are you saying Kaiser Reinhardt has passed away? And the, the his adjutant, who I'm sure is getting a real kick out of reporting it in this specific manner. Yes, yes. You know like, this asshole did this on purpose. <laughs> is like, no, when I say Kaiser, uh, I mean not His Majesty Kaiser Reinhard von Lohengram, but uh, the uh, former Kaiser, Erwin Josef II. Yes. And uh, <laughs> this scene is so much. It's a lot. Like, even we were like, wait, I mean, we didn't believe Reinhardt was dead, but the rumors spreading, I was like, wait, what? Like, how, how would that, like, I, I had a similar reaction to Volant of like, wait a second, like, that doesn't make a lick of sense, but, yes. you know, yes, that adjutant was definitely, like, definitely leaning into the, like, I'm gonna, like, <laughs> leaning into the phrasing of it to, to, uh, to, uh -huh. to pull one over on Volant if just for a couple seconds. Yeah, and, uh, we... They basically say uh, a suspicious man was detained yes. uh, in a rural town on Hyneson. Yes. And bungling that... poet Landsberg. Yes. The bungling poet Count he's, Landsberg he's is He's on back. the run. He's on the run. He's bungling his way out of being chased by the cops. It's a fucking crazy and sequence. This is This scene is unbelievable. <laughs> this is... Like in a in a story with unbelievable moments, this might actually be one of the most like uh, ridiculous ones I think we have ever seen in this show. Like, so we see Count Landsberg, who has clearly seen better days. He's looking real gaunt. Yes, and he sneaks into his hotel room, and we there's see a, there's a sack. On the couch. Yes, there is a dirty sack on the couch. You know, but, I, I feel like I instantly went like, oh no, oh no. Right, I, think, I, think, I think we both went to the absolute worst place possible, <laughs> but I think there's also a part of us that's like, nah, they couldn't, right? Like, that's, that's too much. It's too much. And the cops break in, they start beating the shit out of the bungling poet, and they're like, hey, what's that sack? And Landsberg <laughs> is like, no, no, look at the sack! And they open the sack and it is totally the corpse the skeletal corpse <laughs> of Erwin Yosef the second Jesus Christ <laughs> like they just go for it they just totally went for it like fancy collar and like, his yes, rings right. and shit right like it's not just like right right it's like it's not even just like it's a corpse it's a corpse that is dressed up as Erwin Yosef the <laughs> second like yeah, like like fine raiment and jewelry and all and it's <laughs> oh my god it's, it's some ratchet shit it's really ratchet it's i cannot believe this show would just go that far like it's it's one of those moments that is just like so over the top in like a very specific way that i cannot believe <laughs> yes. it even like like I feel like up until like I feel like the kind of show legend of the Galactic Heroes has been I I always feel like that's the kind of moment that you'd like I don't know I, I 
Legend of the Galactic Heroes is not like I mean it is gratuitous in some ways, right? Like with its like very wanton axe murder, but I feel like it's not gratuitous. Like Legend of the Galactic Heroes did not strike me as a kind of show that would just show a child's corpse on screen. I mean, we got the like stock photos in the history episode, but that was for a very specific effect of right, right. Like yes, we had the stock photos of like the war crimes being carried out in the documentaries, but like. Right, like, there was a very specific context for that, of, like, you know... These are the atrocities that were committed in the past. Whereas, like, this is just straight up... I mean... It's... It's so much. <laughs> and we basically find out that Count Landsberg, uh had been on the run, and that Erwin Yosef uh, had died of starvation, which, yes. wow, that's a way to go. It's it a also way, yeah. Wow. Fucking... The bungling poet truly yeah. bungled this one. The big like, question in the air for me here is, where the fuck is Schumacher? Right. Schumacher is uh, is uh, very blatantly not shown like, like in the group. Right. Like, my immediate thought was, he the first chance he get got, he just bailed, because he was never in this for uh, right. the Kaiser to begin we, with. We have to remember that Schum the only reason Schumacher went along with this whole play in the beginning is because he was blackmailed by Rupert. Uh, yes. And Rupert has been dead Long for a off. while. <laughs> so I wonder, like, I think there's a, right, so I think the, the logical conclusion is, oh, like, Schumacher realized, oh, wait, like, the man who was holding the rope above my head is dead. Like, I don't, I have no loyalty to this shit anymore. But, uh, but also they didn't, like, they didn't even, like, mention Schumacher. And it's one of those things that makes me wonder, like, is this the kind of show that is so, like, granular about the, <laughs> the the comings and goings of its specific characters that we will see, like, one scene of Schumacher at the end to explain what he was up to? <laughs> That's really going to be, like, Sch a montage the last episode. Right, right, like a last episode montage. Or is Schumacher just one of those characters that just got written out because, frankly, yeah. he's not that important? Too bad. I do like Joji yeah. Nakata. Yeah, I did like Schumacher. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, you know, he, he is one of those weird characters that that we specific like. Look, I, I, I have avoided reading most like threads and forum posts about Legend of, of the Galactic Heroes because I don't want to get spoiled. Mm -hmm. But as far as I could tell, we are the only people on the <laughs> planet who care about Schumacher as a character. Sure. And, you know, he's just one of those weird characters that we, for some reason, got strangely attached to. Maybe because of Joji Nakata. Hell but, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it, it, you know, it speaks to like, hey, this is a show with a lot of characters. And I think that it really speaks to how well fleshed out the setting is that we would even wonder, like, what happened to this, like, one bit character who mattered right. for, like, all of three, four episodes, you know, like, like, look, I think there's a reason why we can name drop, like, Schumacher and, like, Lady Benamunde, like, <laughs> it's nothing, but, like, it took us until Lutz's death to be able to reliably tell apart Lutz and Wallen. Like, sorry, Wallen. Sorry, Lutz. Like, like no exaggeration, right? Like, yes. no, it's completely correct. Like Schumacher, Lutz. I mean Schumacher, Lady Benamunda. Yeah, we love those guys. Wallen, Lutz. Who? <laughs> uh, sorry, Lutz. <laughs> sorry, Lutz. Um. But yeah, Wallen basically says, uh, send a report to Fazan and we're done with this matter because we really need to deal with the revolt and stuff. There's yes, the there's, riots. There's stuff going on. And uh, we cut from that to uh, Boris Konev and the Undutinus running the blockade again. Yes, yes. Like for the, like the eighth fucking time or whatever. You know, yeah, Konev, you know, Konev Marinesque. <laughs> Real good smugglers, apparently. Yes, yes. Because they've been doing uh, it for a while. True that, true that. And they're here to deliver the news of the young Kaiser's death. Yes. And uh, Julian on, uh, on the young, the, the commemorative Yang Wenli bench in Easter Lone yes. Park. Yes, the Yang Wenli memorial, like, resting, <laughs> and, resting slash brooding slash internal monologuing bench. That's the uh, one bench in uh, the park that doesn't have the anti-homeless spikes on it. Uh, oh god <laughs> Young would never install those on benches I know but Young the Empire <laughs> the Empire would yes yes if if anything if anything those benches had anti-homeless spikes on them back when Iserlone was, <laughs> was held by the Empire and the first thing Young did when he took over Iserlone was Shango a sander and <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, yes. Just like, like give, gave him a belt sander and had them like <laughs> remove those spikes. Because Yang enjoys sleeping on benches way too much to, uh, to deny other people the same opportunity. Yes, anyway, Julian, uh, you know, thinking a lot about his role <clears throat> and how even though when he was younger, he really wanted to be a soldier and join the military. Now that he's in a leadership position and has to deal with the possibility of coming battles and fighting people dying, he wants to become something else. Yes. Something be- what lies beyond that of a soldier. Uh, what indeed? What, you know, what, I mean, it's... Yes. I mean, it's the thing that, like, you know, if, if it's like the one lesson Yang was hoping to teach Julian the whole time, right? Like, like... Yeah. Be a good be a good enough soldier, get your pension, retire, and do something else with your life because this world is not worth dying for. The words of Yang Wenli, a man who literally uh, died for do- democracy. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yep. but, and meanwhile, we you know, we can't worry about right, right, we can't worry about all this heavy stuff cuz we're about to celebrate New Year's. You know. Which apparently everybody celebrates at the same time yeah. in the setting. They talk you about know, I have one of those. I have no right? clue how the, I have no clue how the galactic calendar works in this setting. I think they have some kind of standard time, but but yes, yes, they're getting ready. You know, Poplin and, and Dusty are are hanging uh, decorations, and mm-hmm. you know, uh, every everybody's getting ready for some yeah. good times. Julian has a nice panning shot where he looks at the table or whatever, and like. He sees all the faces of those who are no longer with us, whether because they're dead or because they left, uh, and sees them superimposed on the smiling faces of those who are still here. Yeah, it's a it's a nice little moment that like <laughs> reminds you that this one shot where like there's a bunch, you know, it's like Fisher and Murai and Patrachev and like um, Ivan Konev, and then you know it. it fades back into the present where it's like Sewell and Merkatz and Schneider and Boris Konev, but Mashenko and a uh, pilot guy, Space Adventure Cobra just faded. <laughs> oh, did they? <laughs> where, like, there's, totally... there's nobody because there's nobody there in the flashback bit. Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That's... Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. They just kind of fade. Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's pretty good. Yeah, it, it's a pretty good moment that just reminds you that, like, yes, look, the mm-hmm. FBA has lost a lot of people. They have arguably lost more and more important people than the Empire has. But look, we're still here and we're still fighting, and yep. you know, life goes on. And, and uh, Karin comes by to uh, invite Julian to go to party, and uh, things get a little awkward. Although at least Julian's no longer like owning himself every single fucking time. Uh, right. Yes. At least he is no longer tripping over himself at this yes. point. Now everybody can see there's a thing going on here. Oh, of course. I or mean, Shenkoff, people... Shenkoff's up on some balcony with some right. random lady grabbing him. Yes. Yes. And he yes. just, just toasts to no one. <laughs> it's a very, a very Shenkoff move. <laughs> And uh, Dustin Poplin spray each other with champagne. <laughs> yes, yes. Like it really makes you wonder. Like I guess Ezerlone must have like some like Star Trek style, just like matter replicator technology or something. Oh, they I'm could sure, just afford I'm to. Sure Konev brought a bunch of nice liquor for New Year's. You're probably right. I was gonna say like it does make a wonder. Like I guess they don't really care about austerity measures or anything. If these two idiots can just get away with just like spraying expensive liquor around, but <laughs> it's New Year's. It is New Year's. Fair enough. And uh, I think with that, that kind of brings a, clo- a close to episode 99. Indeed. And uh, we uh, move on to episode 100, uh, uh-huh. which to to uh, to celebrate such a momentous occasion as the 100th episode of Legend of the Galactic Heroes yeah. opens with a wedding. Yay! Weddings. Yes. On the yes New Year's, right. During the New Year's party, Reinhardt announces the marriage is happening. Yes. Uh, Reinhardt officially announces his marriage to Hilda. All of the Imperial dudes immediately begin to tempt fate in a Bittenfield-esque manner. Uh, <laughs> a toast, saying to, a thing, toast to the prince. Right, a toast to the prince. A toast to the to the enduring legacy of the Lohengrom dynasty. Uh-huh, a toast wow. to peace. Yeah, last, last peace. year was such a fucking mess. I'm sure this year will be lovely and peaceful. 
the right a toast to, to a toast to you know a toast to peace in our times all of our enemy every single one of our enemies have been defeated we have no more enemies no more sources of strife uh, from here on out the kaiser will focus purely on his civic duty of improving the empire there are no more wars and there will be never more wars never, in like the nothing bad will ever happen ever again yes it's a little on the nose it, uh, you know, considering that what we, the audience, know is on the horizon, it's it's uh, very, it's very funny. Oberstein um, takes some time out of the New Year's party to glare at Papa Mariendorf. <laughs> yes, yes. Mariendorf was like, you know, Mariendorf was just like, you know, Mariendorf, Mariendorf, Elder Mariendorf was just being his, like, jovial self, you know, like, being, you know, shaking hands with people, being like, oh, I'm such a happy dad, all that stuff. And Right. They don't, like, while, because of his temperament, nobody was like, nobody except Oberstein, of course, is like, hmm. Right. Look like this the, guy the, trying to, like, weasel's way in or whatever. Right. Like, the vibe you get is, like, nobody else would really, like, nobody else is asking for Mariendorf to resign. Like, right. I think most of them would be fine if Mariendorf kept his position. And really, it's only Mariendorf himself and Oberstein who have any concerns about the precedent it sets. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah. So, kind of with that, um, with an- that announcement taken care of, we return to the Mittermeier uh, household. Where uh, Mittermeier asks Ava if he'd be a good politician because uh, he has been offered the position of Ministry of Internal Affairs. Uh, there's a qu- very quick line here where uh, they're playing with the baby, and uh, Mittermeier's like, "Wow, having a kid like sure makes things lively. I wonder if Eisenach's like this, right?" And it's like, it's, "Wait, Eisenach has kids?" A quick punchline of Eisenach, <laughs> Mo Eisenach, yeah, goof. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very good. Like they hold on the beat just long enough, like <laughs> of like, what would Eisenach have to say about child rearing? And it's like I don't know, like a quick wave and a thumbs up or something. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, really makes you wonder how Eisenach wooed whoever his wife is in the first place. Yeah. Like, did he just did he just wave his hand very seductively or something? <laughs> He's a man but, who's good uh, with his hands. <laughs> yes, yes. Hey, good advice. Maybe, maybe, maybe Isaac has some good advice to give after all about about relationships. Be good with your hands. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But, but yes. So Mittermeier tells Ava about uh, the 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 offer to become a chief of Min- of internal affairs. Um, Ava says that uh, I I I was kind of hope. Well, so <laughs> Ava says I think so, Mittermeier, because you're a fair and honorable man. And I was going to say, unfortunately for Mittermeier, he's a fair and honorable man. <laughs> Therefore, not a good politician. <laughs> yes, yes. But uh, but uh, Mittermeier says that despite the fact that realistically <laughs> he actually... Like, Mittermeier, Mittermeier is beginning to come around on the Yang Wen Li philosophy of, like, maybe retirement is not such a bad idea. Especially if I've spent the last five years straight just fighting wars constantly. Yeah. But realizes yeah. that. Sorry, go ahead. No, oh, yeah, you you were gonna say. It. <laughs> uh, okay, sure. But Mittermeier also realizes that he can't stay out of politics because if he doesn't get into politics, it's all it's it's actually going to give Oberstein even more power and nah. more influence in the political realm, and that Fucking he might have he might have to become minister of internal internal affairs out of sheer spite for Oberstein. Which, as we all know, is a great motivation for for doing things Hell in yeah. life. <clears throat> but, uh, but yes. But meanwhile, uh, other people are also deeply concerned with um, yes. historical and political precedent. I like the scene uh, a lot. Uh, I like the scene a lot as well. Um, you want to kind of set it up? We get like a shot of the conference table of various governmental ministers um in various positions and they're basically arguing and discussing over how much authority hilda should have as the empress as the kaiserin yes because like is she going to be the joint ruler does she have succession rights or only does the kaiser's line of succession rights right and i think what i what kind of tipped me over the edge on the scene is that they all agree that hilda specifically is obviously smart and competent enough to be joint ruler. Like, nobody's arguing that. Not a single one. But 
<clears throat> what's the problem is potentially setting legal precedent for you know hundred yes. years later when the Kaiser is an idiot and an asshole and has married a gold digger. Um, <laughs> right. Like, I mean, that's the thing, right? It's like, you know, the, this is a very real thing they have to like, this is a very real, like, and serious right. conversation people have to have about the founding of a government. You know, like we've talked about this in the past, you know, in past podcasts about like the founding of like the United States of America and the writing of the constitution and like all of these like weird precedents right. you have to write that you can't even anticipate. <clears throat> Right, like our founding fathers you know, like, could so not have like, anticipated like, what less than a hundred years ago when they had to limit presidents to two terms. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's like there are things that like they just could have never have anticipated, and it's kind of the same thing here. It's like, yeah, right now, like it would make a ton of sense for Hilda to become joint ruler of the empire because she's a very capable, very like. Like not not only very capable, but a very moral person who is deeply concerned with the well being of her fellow man. But that's not going to be true of the Kaiser and 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 his wife a hundred, two hundred years from now, right? Like, like that that yeah. precedent alone could set up some very dangerous things. I mean, hell, just hell. Even 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 the succession rights by bloodline thing could have huge implications down the line. You know, when you talk about like. You know, does that mean that someone like 100, 200 years from now will be able to say mm. like, well, I am like, I am this, I am the great, great grandson of Elder Mariendorf's brother. <laughs> and that makes me a Mariendorf. And thus that makes, you know, according to the, right. right, which, yes, yes, according to the constitution that they wrote 200 years ago, makes me a Lohengrom, right? Like there, there's a... These are things they have to consider, and like it, it cuts both ways. Because what happens if you do have somebody who is the great, great, great grandson <laughs> of Elder Marindorf's brother, who is like a legitimately great ruler, but they can't claim to the throne because they wrote that out of the constitution? It's it's mm -hmm. this is this is a tough shit to think that about. Not immediately, that do not come to apparent uh, consensus, at least not on camera. And no, the, the narrator. No, so we, the narrator is like, of course, to, uh, you know, those who support Republic democracy, this just seems like, it's like this such, the bloodline discussions are an object of derision. Yes, yes. Even <laughs> the, yes, the narrator. It's ridiculous to determine succession via bloodlines. Right, yes. The, the narrator gets another, <laughs> gets another real good jab in here, just pointing out like, yes, for uh -huh. those of you who support Republican democracies and the rights of all man to a political <laughs> voice, the very concept of assigning authority by bloodline is absurd. <laughs> yep. But uh, um, we move on from never, that. Nevertheless, they had to worry about it. It's something they, under an autocratic system, have to deal with. Yes, yes. Uh, but we move on from there because Anna Rose arrives at Fazan yeah. for the wedding. I haven't seen her uh, in a long time. Yeah, totally she's uh, yes, looking real pale. Yes, uh, but yes, uh, Hilda meets with her, and when the two appear on screen together, like a weird fuzzy filter appears on the screen. <laughs> yes, it's like a shoujo anime or uh, something. Well, like when they rub Vaseline on the lens for yes, it's it's uh, it's quite something. Too much royal beauty in one room. Exactly. Apparently so. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, uh, it's just it's it's just a weird seed. Like I, I'm not even sure there's that much to take from it, other yeah. than just like Anna Rose being like, oh, "I'm glad you kept taking care of Reinhard Hilda. The last time I asked somebody to take care of Reinhard, he died. He died yeah. So, <laughs> oh boy, oh, uh, yep. And uh, Hilda muses about Anna Rose's place in history, basically. Yeah, how if she hadn't done what she did, like. Reinhard would have not done what he did and changed the face of the galaxy. Yeah, I mean, Hilda is basically Hilda's basically become the surrogate for us, the audience, who <laughs> talk about like how far back are you allowed to go in the timeline to set up like, well, <laughs> if this one thing had changed, all of these other <clears throat> things would be entirely different, right? Uh -huh. Like, I I was I I was in a conversation, you know, with you and like the rest of like the 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 Legend of Galactic Heroes watching crew about like are there pivotal moments where like the FPA could have been saved? And like one, like less obvious one I brought up was like, what if Bucock had accepted the offer to become interim commander after Kubersley gets shot? See, but then I think he might've been killed 
uh, by the, by the NSMC, NSMC, as opposed to because he didn't have the authority, they were willing to just let put him under house arrest. Whereas if he right. had been in that position, I think they might have just shot him. Right. But then on the other hand, the argument is, but if Bukok were there as the interim commander, would, it, would he, the popular choice with the troops, have right. perhaps prevented the NSMC from gaining ground in the first place? <laughs> but then it's like, okay, sure, you could ask that, but maybe you should go even further back. <laughs> what if Andrew Fork hadn't shot Kubersley? Uh, and then you go even further back, what if Bukok hadn't shouted Fork uh, into a coma? <laughs> and... But then you might as well go even further back. What if Fork hadn't suggested his dumbass plan in the uh, first place? And you could go even <laughs> you can go even further back and be like, well, maybe the rightfully democratic democratically elected members of the FPA council shouldn't have voted on the war in the first uh, place. And then you go even further back, maybe Yang shouldn't have <laughs> won either loan so hard. And you could go and it just uh, it never ends. History's, it never ends. Everything's made of history. Right. And so when Hilda is musing to herself about like, oh, did Anna Rosen somehow like, is Anna Rose responsible for the founding of the Lohengrom dynasty? It's like, Hilda, yes, you can think that. But also, if you think like that, you're going to lose your mind very quickly. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. And so Reinhard uh, enters the room and basically says, we should call each other by our first names now. And, uh, and then they completely fail to do so. Right. Like the narrator notes that, despite this conversation, they eventually would default to Kaiserin and Your Majesty. <laughs> yes, it's uh, it's very funny. I mean, it it's one of those things of like obviously the two like love each other very much, but sure. But or <clears throat> what I mean yes, is like yes, they yes. they do care for each other, but mm-hmm. like they are never going to be the types of people who are like going to be able to like be casual let go right right let go of that final like kind of mask between the two and like be casual with each other because that's just not who they are right like Uh and you know especially on reinhardt's part like (laughs) the only person worthy of of it being addressed by their first name is not even kirk Kirk, not even kirk he didn't even call kirk his first name didn't he call Kirky Eyes Siegfried a couple times in the oh, flashbacks? He's like, a Siegfried's a peasant name. Kirky Eyes oh, sounds normal. Right. Let me call yeah, you Kirky you're, Eyes. You're right, you're right. I could Okay, no, my bad. It's it's Anna, Anna Rose is the only Anna person. Rose, Anna Rose always calls him Sieg. Calls him Siegfried. Sieg and Siegfried, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Turns out, actually, Reinhardt has always been this kind of <laughs> asshole. Just, I mean, I get it. Like, I... Uh-huh. <laughs> I am not. I am. I am not a. I am not a galaxy conquering genius. But no. I too sometimes have trouble calling people by their first names if I haven't. If I haven't like gotten to know them very well. So sure. I get where Reinhardt's coming from. Understandable. But uh, but yes. Uh, with that taken care of, time for the wedding. Um, time for the wedding being held on January 29th. Indeed. Uh, Hilda, Hilda is here. Law. Yes. Yes. Hilda is here in her grandma ass looking wedding dress. Uh huh. Uh, thing looks like the kind of thing like someone would wear in like the fucking nineteen forties or some shit. But uh huh. Uh, but Oberstein's still looking like a fucking rat. Oh, it's something that uh, a, a s- street hobo would wear at a Memorial Nagano work. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yes, only that level of uh, ostentatious. <laughs> Maybe uh, that one was a little too far, too too deep. Anyway. It's the wedding. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we got this minister who was just so damn nervous. It's like, come on, guy. You surely you must have practiced for this. Mm-hmm. Um, but luckily, we got Bittenfield here to break the ice. Right. And Bittenfield knows how to break the ice by just shouting Sieg Kaiser at the top right. of his lungs. Like the the, the uh, officiant is like super nervous about marrying the Kaiser together. And everyone's quite an awkward. And Bittenfield just screams, "Sieg Kaiser!" From like yes, fourth yes. row. <laughs> yes, it's very good. It's very good. Like everybody's like the wedding. They everybody gets into the wedding. You know, uh, there's a good bit here where Binfield and Mueller are musing about the godliness of of the Kaiser and like how how resplendent he is. And there's a real just like good look on Eisenach's face. It's like that's just like these motherfuckers. Right, he's not impressed with these two at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
like it's it's very good um there's a fantastic moment here where Mittermeier is celebrating the wedding and looks at uh, <laughs> the baby. <laughs> Randall's face fades in superimposed <laughs> over the baby. And it's the funniest thing. <laughs> like, oh, fucking dumb. Like, <laughs> like, you guys who are listening to this podcast will know like what we've picked for our podcast inter- header image by the time you're listening to this. I'll say at the moment we are still discussing what to use for the <laughs> header image, and it is a very close race between like, uh, you know, like champagne uh, spray and right the champagne alcohol. spraying the corpse of a fucking child, <laughs> and then Royanthal's face superimposed over a baby's. <laughs> there are a lot of. <laughs> A lot of good options this week. Uh, bless you, Lush of the Galactic Heroes. Yes. You know, go um, halfway. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, leave it to, leave it to, oh leave it to, to Oberstein, Paul von Oberstein, to come in here and ruin a good thing. It's the so, wedding of Reinhard von Lohengram. This is like, yes. one time this is going to happen forever. Right, you only get one. Uh, I mean, unless you're a real piece of shit, I mean, you only yeah, get one wedding. Reinhardt, and Reinhardt, the ruler of, you know, the the founder of the Lohengram Empire, is only going to get yes. one wedding. Yes, Reinhardt is only getting one wedding, and Oberstein. Not that, like <clears throat> they're walking down I, the hall, and you know everything's nice. Everyone's cheering. Oberstein. And then, Oberstein runs interference <laughs> from the crowd, walks in front of the Kaiser. Reinhardt, you can tell Reinhardt's like, Oberstein, you better have a real good explanation for this. And Oberstein, stone-faced as always, is here to inform the Kaiser that anti-imperial riots have broken out on Heinesen and that they must be dealt with immediately. No fun allowed. I... So Oberstein... Oberstein must... This is so, like, this is so outlandishly, like, fucking dickish of a move. (laughs) Like, everybody's calling him out. Like, Bittenfield, leave it to Bittenfield to have some decency. Like, Bittenfield, of all people, is like, man, fuck you, Oberstein. This is their wedding, right? Like, when even Bittenfield is, like, fucking calling you out on your bullshit. Like, you know you fucked up. And everybody's just like, man, Oberstein, fuck that guy. And, like, Oberstein merely furrows his brow slightly harder at the responses. And uh-huh. I gotta add, like, this is so, like, outlandishly rude of some. Uh, right. like, this is such an outlandishly rude thing to do that I'm forced to wonder, like, it's, it's so, it's so rude. Like, I almost have to think, like, is Oberstein, like, legitimately on the spectrum? Because, <laughs> Maybe. like... Because, like, I almost have to wonder, like, I don't know if he did this, like, mal- like maliciously, right? Is it actually just, like, he has so little understanding of social norms that, in his brain, this was remotely acceptable? Right. Like, like obviously, being Kaiser takes precedence over something like a wedding... Right, like in Oberstein's brain, of course, he is, you know, he's pulling a, you know, he, he even defends himself by pulling the old Spock of, like, I am completely logical, like, you know, uh-huh. this has to be dealt with. And it's like, my guy, there's a time and place, and, like, volen has got a handle of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's one of those things of, again, I don't think this moment is intended to be like, ah, and thus began Oberstein's descent into villainy or anything, but, like, right. it's such a, like outlandishly like just uh, a completely unbelievable thing to do like especially at a wedding that yeah i don't know like it just it it puts oberstein in a very weird light i guess like, it's not like it was an immediate emergency or at least like it's far enough it's it's far enough away that it's not something he'd be able to deal with immediately anyway Right, like, it's not like, like, look, look, this is not like Oberstein running in and, like, saying, oh, man, armed, like, armed cultists are about to charge the church right. or something, or the health hotel, right? This is not, like, an immediate threat to life. This is, like, like, 
Titus it is so far away, my guy. Like no matter what Reinhardt did, whether it took whether he did it right this second or he did it an hour from now, it would not make a difference. And realistically, whatever Reinhardt was gonna do is something that Volan was gonna take care of anyway, because right. that's we call that delegation. And if there's anything that Reinhardt is theoretically pretty good at, it's delegating tasks to his like other equally competent uh subordinates. And it's this really weird moment that's like it's it's like I, I just I don't understand Oberstein's motivation here. Like, is Oberstein intentionally trying to get people to like hate him? Like, is it? Are we actually going to make good on that theory right, that Oberstein yeah. purposely acts this way to like act as a lightning rod for criticism against the Kaiser? Is or is Oberstein that friend that like pretends like he doesn't want attention? from the rest of the friend circle, but he continues <laughs> to do these increasingly asshole like, like, attention-grabbing things under the guise of, like, aloofness because he is just so, like, he can't stand Hilda getting attention on her wedding day. Like, is, is Oberstein that dude who, like, cannot stand anyone other than him <laughs> receiving attention uh... even on somebody else's wedding day? Like, I don't, I just, I just don't know it. Oberson continues to just be an enigma, like a, a, an infuriating enigma. Uh-huh. I just don't know what his deal is. <laughs> neither, neither do I do. Uh, but uh, they talk about their Mittermeier's like, well, we'll take care of it. And if he do, if he can't, then we'll go. And yeah, yeah, yeah. they also specifically note that Hilda holds her tongue, says nothing because she doesn't want to appear to be a meddling Kaiserin, basically. Yes, yes. Which this is a scene where I kind of begin to wonder if I, I begin to wonder, I begin to fear what will Hilda's relevance and influence be on Reinhard from here on out? Because and now, now that she was saying earlier, then now she might have less power than she did. Yeah, because before. Hilda was always in her right to call out Reinhardt because she was technically, like, minister of something something, right? Like, she held a power, she she held a position of political and civic power. It was her job to call out Reinhardt, and she had that as a defense. Like, I hate to be reductive like this, but now that she is not, now that she she doesn't, now that she is not a, not, now that she is not a title holder, or her title holder is now Reinhardt's wife. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, with that comes different societal expectations and like political frameworks. Right. She's and no longer the the staff superintendent of headquarters. She is now the wife of the Kaiser. Yeah, and it does make me wonder, like how how that relationship changes. But long story short, like Reinhard softens up thanks to Mittermeier kind of swooping in there for the save and agrees to try and enjoy the rest of his wedding despite Oberstein's best efforts to ruin it. Mm -hmm. Uh, We return to the Earth Cult again for the second time in this trio of episodes. A bunch of people are mad with Villiers, basically saying, where's the Grand Bishop? Right. Apparently, uh, apparently de Villiers never told the rest of the Earth Cult that the Grand Bishop is dead. Or we assume Uh, he... We assumed we he was ass- dead because he... We assumed he died, he was yes, in yes. the uh, HQ on Earth that got bombed to hell. Yes, yes. The Earth cultists are uh, remarkably gullible because they're like, hey, he suspiciously stopped showing up after the attack on our home base. Uh-huh. Where is he? <laughs> and, uh, you know, despite all these criticisms... Um, Grand Bishop shows up behind De Villiers, uh-huh, and I think. Grand Bishop yes. gives a very, like, very Can. uh, canned statement about how De Villiers is his right-hand man, that all of De Villiers' commands are my commands, so obey anything he says. All right, bye, guys. Uh-huh. And I, I, I immediately was like, this is a ruse of some kind. Yes, yes, I kind of agree. I'm like, hmm, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it, but, uh, yes. you know, I think the point of this scene is kind of show, okay, like one way or another, there is definitely some kind of internal strife happening in the, happening in the earth cult. Mm-hmm. And if that strife actually amounts to anything or not, I think we will, we will see in the following episodes, but you know, point is that with, 
Yeah. And even now, uh, as the narrator would tell you, the, yeah, the so kindling the charcoal <laughs> of conspiracy and disquietude. <laughs> yeah, it was beginning uh, to smoke. Yes. Oh boy, yes. that's a statement. So, um, we ain't we ain't done yet. I have here. a note here about how we felt at the end of this episode before we watched episode one hundred and one. Uh, we were kind of curious as to what the next ten episodes would be about. Basically, like it seemed yeah, as though we, like again, not we that you know, not that we're starting like, to come down on Legend of the Galactic Heroes, but these first two episodes very much start to feel like a sort of denouement, like. Oh, like we were beginning, we were starting to wonder, like, oh, are we already at the end of Legend of the Galactic Heroes? Right. Like, is this the story done? The like its end point, its end state of the Empire's control in the Zelone Republic. Yeah, because like when you, because when these two episodes are setting up the Earth Cult as like the primary final antagonist of the Empire, that's not a very exciting antagonist. That's that's something that will probably give Reinhardt. Like, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I believe that the Earth Cult, it, the, the 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 Earth Cult is capable of inflicting great personal damage to the Empire in terms of like to Reinhard and the people around him. Yeah. However, I have no delusion that the Earth Cult is capable of inflicting societal and political damage to the Empire. Like the disparity in power is just too great. Like. The most that the Earth Cult can do is probably just hurt us, the viewers, by killing (laughs) more people we care about, right? Like, I don't know, kill Mueller, kill Valen, kill Mittermeier, kill Anna Rose, kill uh, Hilda, right? Like, by killing people who who, who we personally care about. But the Earth Cult is not actually capable of hurting the Empire as an institution anymore. It's... The disparity is too great, and so when you are left with a situation like that, what is left for this show then? And that's kind of where we were beginning to get concerned about where the last 10, 11 episodes of the show were going. And then episode 101 happened. (laughs) Yep, Uh, which begins with uh, riots on Heineson because of food shortages, shortages of just resources... In general, because a lot of them were requisitioned by Reinthal for the rebellion. So we get, you know, parades of people with uh, big signs that say, supply food! Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, and such. And uh, to not helping the matter is that the military storehouses are bombed. Yes. So and Someone has interfered with... The logistics of of uh, Heineson's uh, supply delivery system kind of yes. exacerbating the shortage. So Vol, I note that Volen's doing his best to put down the riots, like he's handing out military resources to pacify the people. Yes, but he can't but, uh, really deal with everything. Right. The point there's this idea that like yes, he's put down, he's put out the fires for now, but the resentment is still there. Like, like. The food shortage is 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 the catalyst, but it leads to this idea that yes, hi, the FPA is dead, but the people of Heineson have not forgotten, and there is still a this lingering idea that there are still people there who are more than willing and ready to to uh, to strike back at the Empire. This isn't really what I'm about to say is not particularly related to the plot of Legend of Black Heroes, but I was please do we I love did, our tangents. I did read a thing today that in World War One, um, <clears throat> Germany was going through like food shortage, and uh, yeah. at some point they decided these pigs eat as much as a human. We should get rid of the pigs because that's using up too much food. So they killed a ton of pigs, and. Uh, but pig shit was a real good fertilizer for grain, and then it really just made the shortages worse. I mean, <laughs> if there's one thing that we can learn from history, it is that uh, it took mankind a very long time to begin to slowly figure out the concept of like environmental causality. <laughs> you know, the famous example, of course, is like Mao Zedong's. Um, directive in communist china to uh to 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 uh to, to hunt for to uh, hunt down swallows by the mass by 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 the millions um 
Because what, was, what was the rationale behind this? The rationale is that the swallows were like eating grain. They were like stealing grain from from the storehouses. Okay. But the problem is that swallows don't only eat grain, they eat insects. Right. And when they had caused a mass near extinction of the swallow bird population, it led to locusts. Lots of locusts eating the grain instead, exacerbating the food shortages even worse. And uh, arguably, millions of people starved to death as a result of it. And, <laughs> you know, or, or you want to talk about like every single time mankind has thought, man, this pest is really annoying. You know what would deal with this pest? If we introduced Chemical. a new <laughs> pest to hunt down that old pest. Ah. And then I the new pest, the, the new pest starts growing out of control, and the people, usually Australians, say, "You know what would deal with that new pest? The introduction of an even newer, stronger <laughs> pest to hunt down that pest." <laughs> and Didn't that's why, Aust- yes, and that's why Australia is what it <clears throat> is today. Yes. Well, but, meanwhile, um, uh, a lot of the navigational star maps and stuff were deleted. F is on. Yes, it's on, somebody like being particularly important because, uh, as it was once uh, the center between the two factions, has all the data. Yes, uh, but so all they have, right. They have lost map data, uh, including of the Isarlone corridor as well, yes. which I think is and an interesting former, thing they brought up. Former, uh, FPA territory, I think. Yes, yes. Um, they mentioned that luckily they had a backup. Uh, Oberstein had the wherewithal. To, uh, to save the data, or parts of the data, right. I guess. Yes, big copies. Yes. But uh, it leads to this idea that the Empire is uh, more vulnerable than it might initially seem. Yes. And that despite the control Reinhardt holds as its sole ruler, he is but one man, and there is only so much he can do. And, uh, and yeah, so Kessler is on the case of investigating what the deal with this was and basically pins it on a uh, former Fazan brass, specifically one Adrian Rubinsky. Yes. He catches a double agent at the navigation center where the, the deletion happened uh, and under, under uh, interrogation reveals that Rubinsky is still in play. And to the rest of us, we're like, yeah, dog Rubinsky has been doing this shit for like 30 episodes. But 30, 100 episodes. <laughs> yes, you're right, you're right. But it's very interesting that this is the Empire... This is the first time the, the Empire has just, just now realized Rubinsky's influence. It's not only Rubinsky's the first time influence, they pin something on him. Right, but also his connection with the Earth cult, specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, got a great bit here where Bitfield is like, Ah, Rubinsky, I can't wait to skid him alive and paste his skin on my boots so I can stomp on it whenever I walk around. And it's like, Binfield, please. <laughs> uh, uh, cool. <laughs> sure. That asshole's still here. Mecklinger uh, has the idea that maybe we should, uh, offer Lang a pardon and give him an, a chance to, right. uh, get and back at Rubinsky. Lang has, it's now it's personal with Lang against yes, Rubinsky. Uh, Kessler thankfully is like, I'm going to do a lot of things. I'm not going to <laughs> take Lang out of jail. Right. And, and uh, you know, to Mecklinger's credit, he's like, you're at, you're right. That was a dumb idea. Yes. Yes. Bless, bless <laughs> Mecklinger. Man needs some more screen time, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's just interesting. And, and of course they mentioned that, uh, Oberstein knew this whole time, but didn't tell anybody else uh-huh. that, uh, that Rubinsky was connected to the earth cult. He just didn't trust them. Right, Oberstein's like, oh, well, yeah, the narrator's like, oh, you know, that, oh, that rascal Oberstein, he just can't trust people. He has trust issues. And it's like, motherfucker, do you know how many lives could have been saved if you could have just told? Like, right. Like, it's 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 one thing if it's like Oberstein not telling, I don't know, Bittenfield about the Rubinsky Earth Cult connection, but it really comes under, like, criticism when Oberstein didn't even tell Reinhardt about this. It's like you get, like the excuse of oh o- Oberstein is distrustful. He doesn't know who to trust in the in the in, in empire politics. Right. It's like, well, what about your fucking Kaiser? Like, mm-hmm. you could have told him and then leave it up to his 
enlightened dick you know enlightened highness to 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 figure it out but i don't know i like the narrator is like and oberstein would be criticized by the for this by future generations which (laughs) good Uh like if there's anybody in this story who deserves to be criticized by future generations it's oberstein and the uh subject of the conversation shifts to ease alone basically and how yes we should decide on if we're going to let them exist or if we're going to smash them into hell or or what. And ultimately, it's going to be up to Reinhard and uh, that they need to basically they basically are going to sit on it for a bit. Yeah, they, they basically can't really decide what they want to do with Iserloan, both politically and militarily. Right. Especially you know, now with Reinhard present. Uh, yes, yes. Like... Because, you know, obviously a guy like Binfield just wants to go over there and punch Iserloan in the mouth, but the rest of them are like, yeah, but Reinhardt has this weird relationship with Iserloan, and, like, we kind of have to respect that to an extent. Also, uh, he's not healthy. Yes, the Admiral start talking in the open about Reinhardt's health. This is no longer, <laughs> like, a worst-kept secret. Yeah, yeah this is, also, like, open discussion. <laughs> And also, they're running out of money because they yeah doing a lot of war. Yeah, they for the first time finally. in this show, they finally address the empire's seemingly endless supply of finances and manpower, and say that actually no. Turns out that Reinhardt fighting like eighteen wars in the last five years has uh, really drained the finances of the empire, and like it's not an issue yet. But it could be an issue down the line. It could even begin to start affecting the civic sector yeah. if not addressed soon. And I'm glad they're bringing this up. They're finally bringing up that, hey, like, in many ways, Reinhardt brought this upon himself, right? Like, Reinhard, Reinhardt's the one who wanted to fight all these wars, and now uh, chickens are coming home to roost. Yep. Indeed. Uh, meanwhile, back at Ezerloan, uh, Julian is uh, trying to figure out what Ezerlone should do publicly about the right, riots. Because he feels that as the final bastion of Republican democracy, that if the riots are from democratists, basically, against the, the autocratic oppression, then on a like a ideal, ideological level, the Ezerlone Republic has to help them to support democracy. Right. Um, or at least, if nothing else, publicly recognize the legitimacy of those riots. Right. But because... Also, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. It's also that their military is quite small, and if they do take a defiant stance, like, will they even have a chance at winning a potential war? Yeah, and there's this idea that Julian starts to get into is that, yes, like... We might get pulled into a war, but basically we need to ask ourselves right now in the here in the here and now of the Ezerlone Republic and it's such a, it's early nascent stage, we need to decide what is our fate. Like what what will people remember us as? Because not helping not helping the riots will probably save Ezerlone in the in the long run, but what it will do is destroy the soul of the Ezerlone Republic. Like it, it, people will people will point to them as hypocrites as as cowards yeah if they choose to just if they choose to prioritize their own self-preservation over the ideal of democracy when arguably and this is the thing julian kind of talks about argues with, internally with himself is that arguably the only thing the is alone republic has going for it is the heart and soul of liberal democracy like yeah. the only thing the Ezerlone Republic has going for it. The only thing, the only reason why people would support it is because it is the last bastion of democracy. And if they stay too isolated or too, like, anti... If they stay too isolated, <laughs> they, then they won't really be that anymore. Like, they'll just be their little hovel off in the corner of the galaxy rather than right. democracy. Yeah. And basically, what what, what are we, we going to do? What, <laughs> right, what should we do? Once again, the Israel Republic. What would Yang do? What would Yang Wen Li do? Yes, yes. What would Yang Wen Li do? Indeed. But meanwhile, 
<laughs> we uh, return to uh, Poplin and Dusty uh, because every now and then we need some levity. It's true. And uh, Poplin has finished training Karen and some of the other uh, cadets by the looks Dusty's of it. He's like, hey, Poplin, I heard you're going to be 30 this year. You're finally one of us. You're an old and man. Poplin, right. And Poplin's like, ah, until I turn actual 30, I'm still in my 20s. Uh, and, and Dusty's like, when's your birthday, Poplin? And Poplin's like, try Zember 36. <laughs> it's very good. Uh. Just, uh, uh, Karen can't help but laugh at it. You know, they, the, uh-huh. the two kind of muse that Karen has really chilled out the last few months. You know, uh, gee, I wonder why. Uh, Karen gets invited to a mixer, yeah. um, gets teased by her fellow girls about, uh, you know, maybe a, a crush she has on a certain someone. A certain uh, serious thinker. Uh, yes. And, uh, you know, she denies it, but also immediately, <laughs> the next scene is her immediately going to talk to Joy. <laughs> yes, it's very good. Uh. Yes. Yeah, and she basically finds Julian in his brooding, agonizing about his choices self, and uh-huh. Karen reminds Julian of something pretty important, is that, Julian, you, we picked you. You were chosen by us. We picked you to make decisive choices with conviction. And that, like, of course you're gonna, like, of course you're gonna, like, agonize over your options, but at the end of the day, like you, you know, we, we, we are the ones who chose you to be our leader. So whatever choices you make, we will follow them. Yeah. Although I do really like any other any other show. This would be like usually be like, yeah, you're right, and would be invigorated by this by this statement. But Legend of Galactic Heroes, like narrator notes that. Uh, what she really did was add more weight onto his shoulders because he was always, Julian was always a person who like constantly deliberated between his personal feelings and fulfilling his responsibilities. And uh, it's harder to balance that (laughs) when people keep telling you stuff like that. Yeah. But I mean, I think they also mentioned that. I mean, the narrator literally says that, in many ways, Karen had unintentionally, like, yes, given Julian like the advice he needed. I mean, as we see with this at the end of this episode, Julian makes a decisive choice. Yes. Um. Let's see. So they go to the conference room and uh, start talking about the situation and opinion among the top staff of the Eastern Republic is a leaning towards war with the empire with basically, basically under the idea that if they can get a hold of former FPA territories that could give them the chance to cut off from the empire. Yes. But they also kind of talk about like, are we not also getting dragged along by perhaps, um, are we some other third parties? Are we still uh, dancing Julian- Turbinsky's schemes? <laughs> Right. Julian correctly guesses that the riots might have been part of a wider conspiracy, and that, in fact, them declaring war might, in fact, be exactly what those schemers want. Mm-hmm. Because even though Fazan doesn't have as, military I mean, strength, as the show they can wage continues economic... To do, gr- yeah, like, as yes, the they, they, do, people know that they're being manipulated. Yes. And, you know, there's a, it's, it, there's a good concept of, like, well... Do we need to do what's best for us, even if that does mean playing into somebody else's plans? And how can we benefit more from this than them? Yeah. Um, we have another good argument between Poplin and Dusty. Um, basically about bullshit. Uh-huh. Uh, to the point where even Bagdashu is like, I cannot believe this. He has a great <laughs> look on his face. He is just like, you could tell that this is a man who has witnessed like, like the 60th argument to happen between Poplin and Dusty right. in the Turn middle of the conference room. Yeah. Yes. Like, like somebody out there is writing, like somebody is typing up the official minutes of the like 65th official 
is her lone republic right. like when conference call Bogdashu is the one slamming his hands on the table and saying anyway we yes. really need to talk about is yes <laughs> how we've gotten requests of aid from the alliance territories yes <laughs> and which gets into the idea that uh everyone's asking he's alone for help uh and even though it's bullshit that they are picking out to rely on us uh when we have plenty of other things to deal with we also need to prove that we support democracy right bogdashu basically brings up that because Ezer alone let the empire through the the corridor yes that they are now beginning to earn some pointed criticism that perhaps Ezer alone actually is just happy to play lapdog to the empire in exchange for its survival yeah and that Ezer alone might survive but the spirit of democracy could perish in the process yeah and uh, kind of with all this deliberation, as we kind of alluded to before, Julian makes a decision, and that is that they are going to fight the Empire and make the declaration that Iserlone is indeed the bastion of democracy it claims to be. Right. And Julian kind of gives a good, uh, he gives a good explanation for why he thinks that they are going to have to fight. And it's a really good great bit here where Julian kind of really comes into his own in his understanding of like not just politics and strategy but also like how much of politics and strategy lies in understanding the people behind those politics mm-hmm. uh, Julian brings up that Reinhardt is a warmonger that that is who he is at his core and that the reason why Reinhardt only spared us in the first place is because of the goodwill he had for Yang, a man he considered his martial equal. And that Reinhardt will never recognize us as a diplomatic equal if we do not fight. Like, the only way for us to earn any kind of political equity is if we fight Reinhardt and if we win. Like, right. we're not gonna destroy the Empire, but if we can fight him and we can wear him down... Because of the kind of man Reinhardt is, he will be forced to recognize our legitimacy as an institution. Yes. If you don't fight, Reinhardt is not going to have time for you, because obviously then you don't care about what you're fighting for. Uh, yeah. According to Reinhardt. Um, according to Reinhardt, anyways, yes. <laughs> I, asked, I think we were joking. It's like in a fucking show in an anime or whatever, where the hero stands no chance against the rival. <laughs> But they yes, do this, yes, right. Steel truck battle, get the like single cut across his cheek, right? Uh, and that's enough for that's enough for Reinhardt to recognize the legitimacy and and this and the guts of our plucky shonen hero Julian Minchi. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so it turns out uh, after a kind of a season of not really languishing, but not really doing much, uh, the Iserlone uh, Republic gears up for war. Yeah. And uh, Valen hears the rumors and uh, gets a little worried. And before all this, actually, uh, Julian does bring up one last thing. He says uh, he has a plan to pull Valen into the Iserlone corridor oh, yeah. in a way that will uh, benefit them. Mm-hmm. And uh, Valen knows that... Uh, He's going to have to start taking measures because he does not have the forces on his own to both maintain peace on Heinesen and deal with Iserlone. Yes. Uh, so he kind of sorties his ships and they kind of take off. Uh, they say they end up being uh, in the middle kind of positioning point. themselves. Yes, midpoint between Heinesen and Iserlone. Um, we are reminded for the first time in a million years that Valen is a single dad, a fact that I had really forgotten forgot. uh... because it's been so goddamn long since that's been brought up uh but we find out that Valen's not going to be fighting on his own and that uh mm-hmm. Eisenach is going to be sent out to reinforce Valen and then on yep. the FPA side we are told that Murkatz also sorties out from Iserlone yes uh, you know Iserlone's in a very precarious position and uh <laughs> it's gonna be rough yeah but, but, and, and here's where, like, the part of me, here's the part of me that gets excited for, 
the battles and the axe murder of Legend of the Galactic Heroes starts getting hyped up because uh, we are informed that this will be the first battle formally under the command of Julian, Min- Julian Minchie. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm excited. I'm pretty excited. Like, we, we've we seen Julian do a lot of things in this show. But we've Commander, seen him, Commander Fleet is not one of those things. Right. Like, we've seen him pilot a starship. We've seen him shoot down a destroyer. We've seen him engage in axe murder. We've seen him engage in shootouts. We've seen Julian uh, command a military, you know, and uh, make some very hard uh, strategic and political decisions. But what we have not seen, what we have not seen from Julian is... So here's the thing. (laughs) We all love Yang Wen Li. Of course we do. We all love Yang Wen Li. Yang's the best, you know? You know, Miracle Yang. And we all love Yang for what? We love Yang for his speeches. We love Yang for his treaties on the nature of mankind and society. We love Yang for his hard drinking ways and his uh-huh. and his and his lackadaisical attitude. But here's the thing. The real reason we all love Yang Wen Li is results. that when the chips come down. That motherfucker will put anyone in the dirt who <laughs> dares to threaten the goodwill of liberal democracy. Got it done every time. Every goddamn time. Every goddamn time. Yang Wen Li coming out here, putting motherfuckers in their place. Just look. We all love Yang for the, the intellectual side of him, but we also love him because it is fun to watch him dunk on the Empire each and every time. <laughs> yep. And that is the one element of Yang Wenli we have not seen in Julian. And I'm very curious what Julian's first foray into Fleet Command is going to look like, because I don't think we have ever seen a character in this position in this story. Like, even Yang Wenli and Reinhardt at the, in, in episode one of this OVA were kind of already established commanders. Right. Like, Either they had led their own fleets before, or like they had, they had commanded men in the thousands before. Like even, they even were, if it was just like the retreat of Alpha Seal or whatever. Yeah, like they had done this before. Like even though you know we didn't see it, like we know that Yang Wen Li was formally schooled in in the officer school. You know, he did the simulations and all that stuff. We don't don't know, we don't know that about Julian because. Julian, like, Julian's education is, was different from Yang's, right? He was, like, a cadet under Yang Wen Li, and then became his adjutant, and then kind of grew up into his own as a as a starfighter pilot, and 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 also a, a CQC commando, and all these other things. But we don't know how much, how much, like, fleet tactics he knows, and... I'm really curious how this turns out. You know, I think that in many ways they're gonna ha- they have Mercats there to kind of serve as the the training wheels for yeah. for Julian, right? Like, no matter how bad things go, you still have Mercats here to get it done. But, <laughs> which which makes me think Mercats not gonna last too much longer. <laughs> oh no, Mercats is not long for this world. I I imagine that narrative narratively, if we truly want Julian to come into his own, right? Then narrative demands that Murkats must die right. to force Julian to lead on his own. Yeah. But until then, if this if this up- upcoming battle between what was it, Volan and Eisenach versus Murkats and Julian, if that gives us a chance to see old Murkats in action again, oh, yeah. I'll happily take it. We have not seen the old dog in action in a very long time. And uh, yeah. I am definitely looking forward to that. And, you know, long story short, if at the end of episode 100, we were like, I don't know. I don't know where these episodes are going. Well, don't worry. By the end of episodes 101, we're back in it. We Hell are yeah. back in it. Is it alone? Here to fight. Things popping off in the Empire. Earth cult up to no good. Who knows what Rubinsky's doing? The last, last 10 episodes. So it's, it's the final core of Legend of the Galactic Heroes. Yeah, we are here. And I think... Uh, I don't know. We could be wrong again. Like, we were so convinced. We were so convinced Royenthal was the final battle of 
Legend of the Galactic Hero. We were so convinced Roenthal's Rebellion was the final chapter of Legend of the Galactic Heroes, and we were so proven wrong in the span of, like, two episodes. So who knows? Is it look at Sordia? Get fucking swatted by Volant, and that's it for you them. Know, maybe, I don't know. Maybe the ED but... will uh, prove itself true, and everyone on that pitch I will die. <laughs> Except for oh, God. Julia, Karen. They'll fight God, for the who knows? End and do something, but maybe everyone who else knows, will die. Yeah. yeah. So who knows? We could still be wrong, but could be. I'm I'm still excited one way or another because this show does what it always does, which is t- uses its slow moments well to bring them into the crescendo of the conflict they are building towards. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and yeah, so even if this trio of episodes were maybe not the strongest in my opinion, I think they've done a good job of setting the pieces up for what's to come. Indeed. And I think with that, we're going to call this a podcast. But, Iro, do you have any kind of final thoughts about the uh, this trio of episodes? Uh, um, if Merc, if Mercats does go, I wonder if we'll, like, pick up Sidley or something as the 11th hour. I don't know. No, I, the 11th hour. I would love that. But I, I have a feeling, so, like, it was fun to see Sidley in that one episode. But the way they framed yeah, that, I, I don't think Sidley is coming back. I still like, think the possibility exists for we will help you take out the Earth cult for coexist and like for the reward of coexistence. <laughs> we will team up against this common foe that we all hate. Yeah, I, again, I think I guess that just feels too clean of a of a conclusion. Like just oh, the Empire and and the FPA team up to 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 fuck over the Earth cult, like. If that was going to happen, you know, I feel like there were so many other opportunities to do that. I mean, yes. Um, but, you know, uh, maybe them killing Reinthal was, you know, the last straw. For maybe, Reinthal. maybe. We'll you know, see. I, could def- I mean, I could, like, I could see it as co- we did this for coexistence. We teamed up for coexistence, but we also, like, make sure to set up for the future that we will never say that, like. Yeah, maybe. Plenty of people are not okay with coexistence and won't f- final. Perhaps. War. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not even necessarily looking that far ahead. I'm just, I, I'm hell. I'm even just curious about stuff. Like what is Julian's plan to draw Volan into the Iserlone corridor? Yeah. You know, there, there, there's a lot of just, there's a lot of immediate stuff. I'm already concerned about that. I'm not too concerned about the, the big picture here because I figure one, one way or another, <laughs> when this show wants us to understand what the big picture is, they'll let us know. And Rose hooks up with uh, Pop. I don't know. <laughs> God, that's that's the sitcom spinoff I want to see is fucking Reinhardt forced to hang out with his new brother-in-law, Olivier Poplin. Christ. Uh, and with just, that, <laughs> what, is, what does that even look like? Is that just like Anna Rose is being like, oh, I found this most wonderful man. I can't wait to introduce him to you. And Reinhardt's like, hmm, I wonder what kind of distinguished gentleman could have earned the approval of my dear sister Anna Rose. Oh, and it's just like Olivier Poplin <laughs> walking in through the door, like fucking sitcom style, walking onto the sound stage. Oh, Jack. Like, fucking the, 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 the audience starts clapping and like just like a sitcom, you know, Olivia Poplin like drops a horrible pun or something, and you get the canned laughter in oh the background, and fucking the camera zooms in on Reinhardt's face, and it's it's and it's like, and that was the day I met my new brother from another mother or something. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, what does the sitcom right. opening even look like? Is it like Reinhardt and Poplin trying to build a house and like? Oh no, Poplin tips over the ladder while Reinhardt's on the roof or something. Uh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> With that, I think we're going to call this a podcast. So as always, let's take care of the housekeeping. You can uh, listen to this podcast and read the rest of our posts on theglorioblog.com. You can follow us on Twitter at theglorioblog.com. No, oops, my bad. At theglorioblog. You can... um. You know, you can uh, listen to the rest of our podcasts, um, including the Glorio Chat, where we talk about currently airing anime, as well as Glorio's King of the Kaiju. Uh, you can listen to all of these, um, what are they, Podbean, Spotify, Google Play, 
you all know the drill there. You can also check it out on YouTube. You can watch Legend of the Galactic Heroes on VRV and High Dive. And I think that's everything. So with that, as always, thank you all so much for listening. Eero, thank you so much for accompanying me on this journey. Thank you. And until next time, we will see you amongst the Sea of Stars. 